this isn't going to surprise you, but product management is changing pretty quickly, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're seeing a pretty ev big evolution in the way that we build products. Started with, we used to ask our teams to deliver outputs, right? So a lot of you might still be working under this model, where you're being asked to deliver a fixed roadmap. What happens in this model is we measure success by, did you deliver the roadmap on time and on budget? But like I said, product management is changing, and we're moving to a much stronger focus on outcomes. So what do I mean by outcomes? We're asking our product teams to deliver performance. It's not just enough to ship features on time and on budget, but we need to create value for our customers and for our businesses. Now this sounds awesome, especially because what it means for product teams is that we're giving them a lot more autonomy. We're letting them find the best path towards the desired outcome. Sounds like product team nirvana, right? The challenge here is that that autonomy comes with a lot of responsibility. And most of us are still learning the skills and mindsets required to consistently deliver on product outcomes. So it's easy to miss those days where all we had to do was ship on time, right? Now we have to ship on time, on budget, and drive outcomes. So I spend a lot of time when I'm talking at conferences talking about the skills required to, to meet outcomes. Things like interviewing, rapid prototyping, running good experiments, types of experiments we just heard from John at Optimizely. Today I want to talk about something a little bit different, something that's harder to change than skills. So as a product discovery coach, I'm working with teams around the world. And what I've noticed is that the best product teams tend to adopt the same mindsets. Now mindsets are attitudes that we have about the way that we do our work. And they're a lot harder to change than to develop skills. But I'm finding they have just as much of an impact on how we work. So today, I want to share three mindsets with you and give you some tips for when you go back home, how you can cultivate these mindsets on your teams and hopefully improve the way that you deliver on outcomes. So the first one is a collaborative mindset. Today, I was not planning to wear a t-shirt at a talk. That's something I've never done before, but I realized I had my Team Everybody t-shirt and I was talking about collaboration. So here we are. Okay, so collaboration. It's really easy to give lip service to collaboration, right? We all work on cross-functional teams. We have to collaborate to deliver products. But this isn't really true. A lot of us fall back to our, our functional silos, right? So we let the product manager manage stakeholders. We let the designers do all the design work, and we let engineers write code. And we develop systems where we do handoffs from one to the other to the other. This isn't really collaboration. So I want to break down what collaboration doesn't look like, what it does look like. But I'm going to start with, when I talk about collaboration, who's collaborating? For most of us, it starts with the trio. This is sometimes called a triad. I don't understand the more complex term for a simple thing that when we have a simple word. So I'm going to use trio. It involves the product manager, the tech lead, and the, and the design lead. When we talk about collaboration, these are the three roles that, at a minimum that need to be required to build good digital products. So when we talk about collaboration, these are the folks that we want in the room for all of our key product decisions. Now, it doesn't mean they all do everything together, right? The product manager is not sitting next to the tech lead as he or she writes code. But when we're making key decisions, and particularly about what to build, we want to leverage the expertise of all three roles. So when we talk about collaborating, we need to figure out how do we get these three roles collaborating together to make the best decisions. Now, most of us have more than three people on our team, so let's talk about the other folks. Um, if you're building any software of complexity, you probably have more than one engineer. Depending on your DevOps, DevOps strategy, you might have some QA folks. And these days, we're actually seeing a lot more roles on our product teams, right? We have data analysts as we bring big data into our products. A lot of us have user researchers embedded on our team. We have product marketers, maybe some customer success folks. Now, it's easy to take collaboration too far and to think of collaboration as consensus. It's not that we want every single one of these people involved in every decision. We would move way too slowly. That's not what we want. We're still building digital products. We want to ship every week. We need to move fast. So the key here when thinking about collaboration is given the decision that you need to make, who needs to be in the room? So for example, if you work on a data-heavy product, you might not have a trio who's collaborating. You might have a quad, because you might invite your data analyst or your data scientist to most of your decisions. 
If you're working on your go-to-market strategy, you're probably going to invite your product marketer. Now, this is pretty common sense, right? The agile crowd has been telling us to collaborate forever. But typically, we don't do it. So let's talk about why. So now that we know who's collaborating, let's get a little bit into what it looks like. And it's hard to talk about good collaboration without talking about bad collaboration. So I'm going to start with what you don't want to do. First of all, we're going to avoid opinion battles, right? So we've all been there, sitting in a conference room, debating till the end of the time, what's the thing we should build next? First of all, this is not collaboration. Second of all, it's not the best way to make product decisions. So collaboration doesn't mean advocating for your own point of view. It means taking the time to explore all the individual perspectives in the room and then doing the work to co-create a shared understanding of what you think as a team. This is hard. Cr Cross-functional collaboration is genuinely hard. It requires, you know, a lot of leaders don't, don't believe me when I say this, and then I remind them that most executive teams don't collaborate very well. It's very hard to get alignment at the executive level. It turns out it's also very hard to get alignment at the team level. And because it's hard, we tend to fall back to handoffs. So I want you to, be, every time you're thinking about how you work, I want you to try to design around to avoid handoffs. Now handoffs are really attractive because they feel efficient. You do this, then I'll do that, and then this other person will do that. And we're being efficient, we're optimizing our time. The problem is with product decisions, it's not about efficiency. We're not running a factory. It should be more about what are we, how are we making effective decisions? What is the best thing we could be building right now? Not what's the fastest thing we could build right now, not, not what's the most efficient decision we can make, but really what, how do we create the most value? And so for effective decisions, we need to collaborate. It's not about these handoffs. So it's not about the product manager decides and the designer designs. It's about integrating our perspectives. Now this is hard to do. And one of the, part of the reason is because we each bring different knowledge and expertise to the table. And we're making decisions from different starting points. So the first step of good collaboration is to do the work to build and maintain a shared understanding. Now I want to give a giant shout out to Jeff Patton. This image comes from his book, User Story Mapping. Um, we're going to talk about user story mapping in just a second. It's because language is vague, it's really easy to sit in a room, talk about your different perspectives, and walk away thinking you're aligned. But the reality is we're all thinking something different like we see in this image. Language doesn't force us to get specific enough, so it's easy to have misunderstandings. So when you're when you're trying to collaborate as a team, when you're trying to make team decisions, step one is to integrate your perspectives, right? So we like to think the product manager is the voice of the business, and the designer is the voice of the customer, and the engineer is the voice of what's possible with technology. And instead of trying to integrate those voices, we argue about which voice should take precedence. Instead, what we want to do is we want to start to visually synthesize our knowledge so that we all understand the voice of the customer. We all understand what's possible with technology, and we all understand what the business needs. And then from that shared foundation, make a team decision. So one of the best ways I've found for teams to do this is to use different types of maps. And you're probably using mapping today. So I want to talk a little bit about what maps to use when. So the first type of map are experience maps. So this includes customer journey maps. It could include life of the customer maps. These are maps that help us synthesize and communicate and align around what do we know about our customer? What do we know about their world? I'm a big advocate of what I call an opportunity solution tree. This is another type of map. It maps the best path towards our desired outcome. So if as a product team, we're tasked with increasing engagement, we can map out all the opportunities that might increase engagement, and we can map out all of our solutions. And the tree helps us align around our decisions and communicate those decisions to others. Story maps, again, thanks to Jeff Patton, we've got a great book on this method, um, help us align around our specific solutions. So just like we saw in Jeff's visual, we can talk about a solution and all walk away with different perspectives, but story mapping really helps us get specific and align around what is it that we're going to build. So the key for good collaboration is to start with a shared understanding. We want to visually synthesize what, we're, what we know 
So we're all making a decision from the same foundation and not arguing over who's more of an expert. So that's our first mindset, is being a, being, having a collaborative mindset. Our second mindset is what I call a continuous mindset. Now we're seeing as an industry, everything is shifting towards continuous. We saw this on the delivery side. We're marching towards continuous deployment. I see the same change happening on the discovery side. So it's not, a lot of us are integrating discovery activities into our work, we're usability testing, we're interviewing customers, but we're taking a project mindset. So a project mindset says, I got a new project, I'm gonna do a little bit of discovery, I'm gonna do a lot of delivery, and then I'm gonna ship it. And then I'm gonna move on to my next project. The problem with that is during all those weeks that you're doing delivery work, lots of questions are coming up and you're not getting answers to them because you're not in your discovery phase anymore. So this is exactly why we don't want to take a project mindset for discovery. Now, I work as a discovery coach where I teach continuous discovery and every team I've ever worked with starts with, Teresa, we already do that. So I promise that you probably do some of it and I, I, start, I defined a very clear definition to help teams have a clear benchmark of what we mean by continuous discovery. So let's walk through this. To me, continuous discovery is weekly touch points with your customers, and by weekly, I mean at a minimum weekly touch points with your customers, by the team building the product where they conduct small research activities in, ser in service of a desired outcome. Now, every word of this definition matters to me, so we're gonna break it down line by line. Why weekly touch points? Turns out we make product decisions every day. And if we really want to be customer centric, we need to infuse as many of those decisions as possible with customer input. Every day that we make decisions without getting input from a customer, we're moving further and further away from being customer centric. So I argue that at a minimum, we want to be talking to our customers every week. Some of the best teams are talking to their customers multiple times a week, and some are even doing it every day. What this cadence allows us to do is it allows us to co-create with our customers. Instead of bringing them a finished product and asking them to validate it, we're bringing them half-baked ideas and saying, come create with us. Now this doesn't mean you're gonna build whatever your customers tell you to build. It means you're gonna use the creation activity to learn about their needs and learn about their context. Okay, so by the team building the product. We've already talked about who is the team. Why does this team need to do their own research? Because again, we're trying to avoid handoffs, so we don't want to get a research report handed to us. We're not gonna act on it, we're not gonna believe it. Also, the product team works on a really fast timeline. We need, quite, we need answers this week. I've never met a centralized user research team that can support dozens of product teams with weekly questions. Our centralized research teams can do long horizon research, and that's awesome, we need that. But our product teams need to know how to get fast, fast answers to this week's questions. These last two lines are gonna take a little bit of time to unpack. So small research activities in service of a desired outcome. I know a lot of teams that are great at research, but they don't drive outcomes, and they, some of them don't even ship product. They're doing research for the sake of research. Here's how you're gonna avoid that. Again, I'm gonna refer back to my opportunity solution tree. This is a map that you can use to map a path to a desired outcome. So we have to start with, what's the quantitative business metric we're trying to drive? Then we're gonna discover opportunities that if we address them, would drive that outcome. If you're not familiar with this language, an opportunity is a customer need, pain point, desire, want, a, way, a place where you can intervene in their life in a positive way. Then we need to do the work to discover the solutions that will address those opportunities. So let's talk about how this looks like. We're gonna use this as our starting point to talk about what a continuous mindset looks like. We're gonna start with that desired outcome, which hopefully is a negotiation between the product leader and the product team. We're gonna conduct at least weekly interviews to discover opportunities. We're gonna generate multiple solutions to the same target opportunity. Now why multiple solutions to the same target opportunity? A lot of teams focus on the first, they hear a problem and they jump right into the first idea that they come up with. The problem with that, when we consider one idea at a time, as we frame all of our research as whether or not questions, we ask, is this idea good or not? The problem with that is that this sets us up to fall prey to confirmation bias. We're twice as likely to see all the confirming evidence that our idea is good and ignore the disconfirming evidence. So instead of setting up a whether or not question, 
we want to set up a compare and contrast question. We want to look at multiple options for the same need, prototype and run experiments around those solutions, and say which of these looks most promising. Now, as a coach, I get asked all the time, how do I know if my prototype feedback is good enough? How do I know if my experimental results are good enough? These are impossible questions to answer. It's not that there's good ideas and bad ideas. It's that there's better ideas and worse ideas. So we need to be setting up a compare and contrast decision. I want to share a visual that will help illustrate this. This is Usain Bolt, the world's fastest 100 meter runner. If you saw him running around a track by himself and I asked you if he was fast, that would be a hard question to answer. Fast relative to what? If he's running against a Porsche, not so fast. If he's running against other humans, maybe. So what we want to set up is a compare and contrast decision. If I show you this image and ask you if he's fast, what would you say the answer is? He's pretty fast, right? So we're setting up compare and contrast decisions. And then finally, we need to prototype run experiments to evaluate are these solutions going to work. Not only are we evaluating are they usable, we need to go beyond just usability testing and test do they address our target outcome. Do they address our target outcome in a way that drives our desired outcome. Now, most people look at this graph and they think about it linear. We, def we define a desired outcome, we do our interviews, we generate our solutions, we prototype an experiment. It's not linear, it's continuous. Here's why. As we evaluate solutions, we learn what we got wrong about the opportunity space. And as we explore more opportunities, we, it inspires more solutions. So there's this back and forth movement. So we want to be building all aspects of the tree at the same time. This is what we mean by a continuous mindset. OK, so let's get to the third mindset. The third mindset is an experimental mindset. Now, thanks to Eric Reese and the Lean Startup, this probably doesn't surprise most of you. However, there are some challenges with the way that we're experimenting in the product world. Most of these challenges are not going to surprise you, but I'm hoping to influence the way that you think about an experimental mindset today. So first of all, most of us are experimenting like 18th century scientists. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this image, but this is an image of bloodletting. Bloodletting was a medical practice that was completely valid in a teeny tiny percentage of medical cases. But in the 18th century, physicians were using it in a lot of medical cases when they just didn't know what else to do. Our equivalent today in the product world is A-B testing. I talk to team after team after team where the only experiments they're running are A-B tests. Now, I'm going to tell you A-B testing is awesome. It's remarkably good at measuring the impact of what we built. And if you're not doing that, you should be. But as a discovery tool, it's one of the worst ones that we have because you have to build everything before you learned if it was the right thing to build. So we need to expand our experiment repertoire to include prototyping, to include Wizard of Oz tests, concierge tests, smokescreen tests. If you're not familiar with these types of experiments, there's tons of resources online. The way that I want you to think about it is how do you experiment without writing code? This is not the only challenge we have with experimenting. Every day I talk to a team where when they're designing their experiment, they're assuming success. This is the best image on the internet, by the way. There's a lot of cool detail. Definitely take a look. I'll be OK if you're distracted. Um, so I'll talk to a team, and they'll say things like, Teresa, why would we run that experiment? What are we going to learn? And I say, what if it fails? And they go, oh, well, then our idea won't work. Well, that's what we're going to learn, right? So a lot of our experiment design, we're going in assuming that the experiment is going to work. This is not what experimentation looks like. So we're going to turn to Karl Popper. Karl Popper furthered the way that we practice science, and he said, Good, good, te good tests kill flawed ideas. They allow us to guess again. We need to design experiments to show us where we're wrong. And that's the mindset we need to take into our experiment design. Not what we typically do with the A-B test. With a t I, so many teams run A-B tests and it fails and they leave the feature live, right? We need, to, we need to embrace the fact that our experiments should be failing and should be failing all the time. That's an indicator that we're learning. Now, Karl Popper isn't the only one to advocate this. It turns out the same sentiment comes up over and over again and has been coming up in the world of experimentation for over 100 years. So I want to walk through a few more examples. I've written a lot about this book. I recommend it almost everywhere I go. It was written by Chip and Dan Heath. It's called Decisive. 
they summarized what we know about decision-making research. Your job as product people is to make decisions every day about what to build. So I highly recommend this book. And what they recommend is if you want to make good decisions, you need to be prepared to be wrong. You can't assume the decision you're making is the right decision. You need to leave room for doubt. And this idea of doubt is what's going to help us overcome confirmation bias. We're going to look for that disconfirming evidence. Now, most of you are probably thinking you already do this, and I promise you, you don't. Please find a partner, someone who hasn't fallen in love with your idea, and have them help you ask questions. Get, ask them to play devil's advocate. Run pre-mortems. Be prepared to be wrong. Look for what you're missing. Now, Chip and Dan Heath aren't the only ones to advocate for this. There's an organizational psychologist at the University of Michigan named Carl Weck. He wrote a paper where he defined wisdom. And he defined wisdom as the balance between having confidence in what you know and doubting what you know. So we have to have confidence in what we know because we need to be able to take action. We need to move forward. But we need to also doubt it so that we're able to see where we got it wrong. Where we're able to backtrack and say, oops, we got to try something else. John Dewey, an educational philosopher from the turn of the century, the 1900s, wrote a book called How We Think about what it takes to be good critical thinkers. And he wrote, to maintain the state of doubt and to carry on systematic and protracted inquiry, these are the essentials of good thinking. So he's, again, talking about date doubt. We've got to maintain a state of doubt. He also talks about systematic and protracted inquiry. I had to Google protracted. It means for longer than you might expect, right? So a long search that's systematic. The opportunity sol solution tree is going to help you be systematic as you search for opportunities and solutions. Protracted is what we mean by an experimental mindset. We're going to keep experimenting for longer than we think we might need to. This isn't all John Dewey gives us. He also talks about the double movement of reflection. Now, I'm going to use some big words. I don't care if you worry about the language at all. He talks about inductive theories and deductive tests. Here's the idea. As you go out in the world and you experience it, you're developing a theory about how it works. If you want to be a good critical thinker, you need to de de design deductive tests to test that theory. As you do that, you revise your theory when you learn what's right and wrong. This is directly applicable to an experimental mindset in the product world because we're mapping out the opportunity space. That's our inductive theory of how our customer's world works. As we prototype and run product experiments and develop solutions, we're deductively testing that theory. When we get things wrong, we need to revise our inductive theory. So he talks about this back and forth movement, right? We need to maintain this state of doubt so that we revise our faulty theories. OK, we just got introduced to a lot of people, so let's summarize. Eric Ries in The Lean Startup tells us to test our assumptions. Karl Popper, a philosopher who advanced the way we practice science, basically tells us we need to kill our flawed theories. That's the point of experimenting. Chip and Dan Heath tell us to be prepared to be wrong. Carl Weck, an organizational psychologist, defines wisdom as the balance in knowing and, the, and what, having confidence in what we know with doubting what we know. John Dewey, an iconic educational philosopher that's played a huge role in Americans, America's civic history, tells us to maintain a state of doubt. All these guys are telling us the same thing. We need to be prepared to be wrong. Now, when I put this slide together, I was super disturbed by how many white dudes were on it. And I'm here to tell you today, you need to be prepared to be wrong. So I'm adding myself to the slide. <laughs> All right, so when you go back to work on Thursday, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about, as a product team, how can you be more collaborative? Do you have the right people in the room for the right decisions? How can you be continuous, more continuous? Are you continuously discovering opportunities and continuously discovering um, solutions? Or are you sequencing them? How can you be more experimental? How can you embrace being wrong? We talk about celebrating our, our failures, but it's really platitudes. This is a day-by-day -day embracement of being wrong. Finally, as a parting gift for you, if you're interested in a copy of this map, I think this is the clearest definition I can give you of what it means to be a continuous discovery team. You can download it at producttalk.org slash continuous discovery. 
Thank you, everybody.